In this video, I'm going to review the Digilent Analog Discovery and look at how it can be used for the analysis of analog and digital circuits. The Analog Discovery combined with the Waveform software forms a two-channel USB oscilloscope, a two-channel waveform generator, a 16-channel digital pattern generator shared with a 16-channel logic analyzer, and, and there is more and it's all in a single package. It's priced at $99 for US students and $219 for non-academics. That's very competitive in comparison to separate tools and it's a very neat package that's ideal for university teaching and independent learning. So the package comes with the analog discovery unit that connects to the PC using the supplied micro USB cable. As all of the cables on the loom are female terminators, there are also some male headers. As an accessory, there's a BNC adapter board available for $20 that plugs into the analog discovery and allows you to use BNC terminated test leads and probes. There are better professional specification tools available for each of the devices, but as a reasonably low cost solution for education and independent learning, the tools are very feature rich. I'll demonstrate this in the video by looking at three different applications. The first application, I'll use a standard rectifier diode and look at how we can connect a basic circuit that uses the analog discovery to characterize its behavior. I'll also look at some of the more advanced analog features that are available. Secondly, I'll look at how we can use the digital pattern generator and logic analyzer to investigate the behavior of a JK flip-flop without using any additional circuitry or power supplies. And finally, I'll look at how we can use the analog discovery logic analyzer and its I squared C interpreter to connect to the BeagleBone I squared C bus and analyze how it behaves when we use the Linux I squared C tools. This is an introductory video so you can skip to the section that interests you by jumping to the timestamps that are displayed here. So just very briefly the waveforms software requires a Windows PC and you can install it by following the download link at the top right hand corner of the waveform site. There is a Linux SDK that exposes features of the Waveforms API. It's not the Waveforms application for Linux, but I haven't looked at that yet. It installs fairly easily and detects the device. One feature is that the Waveforms software will work with an audio input. That's a nice feature, however, it can be confusing when you accidentally plug out the discovery that superficially everything looks like it's working, but the inputs are not what you expect. For the first part of this video, I'm going to look at the Digilance Waveform software um, connected to the analog discovery, and I'm going to look at the analog side. So I'm going to use the scope and the wave generator. Uh, for this circuit, I'm going to use a 1N4004, which is a basic uh, rectifier, diode rectifier. So for this circuit, this is just a standard circuit you would look at if you were getting started with analog circuits. So just let's see how it, this particular setup performs with this type of circuit and how you would connect it up. So here I have my diode, I have my anode cathode, it's, it's directed this direction, so current will flow in this direction if the diode is forward biased. So what I'm going to do now is connect up uh, my scope. So I have my, my scopes are 1 plus and 1 minus, is, that's one of my scope inputs. 2 plus, 2 minus is my second scope input. I'm going to use W1, which is my waveform output, and any of the ground lines as my as my grounding. So I'm going to do that quite quickly. So one plus, I'm going to connect that to the input side of my circuit, the input side of my diode. Uh, one minus, which is the orange wire with the stripe on it. I'm going to connect that to a common point so I can ground these points. Um, two plus, which is the blue wire. It's my second scope. I'm going to use that's the output for my circuit. Uh, the blue wire, two minus with the white stripe, I'm going to connect that to ground two. And then I need to take a ground, so I'm just going to take a ground from any of the black wires will do for the ground. So there's my ground. Um, so I've got a common ground. And then finally W1, which is the yellow wire, I'm going to use as an input. That's my waveform input. Um, these are female cables, female header cables, so I've just put little male headers in there so that I can connect them into my circuit easily. So that's my circuit wired, and uh, we can then go and start up the software. Once we have our circuit wired, we can look at the scope and the wave generator functionality of the waveform software, which is very powerful, very, very feature rich. 
Um, so you can see here we have our wave generator which allows us to generate arbitrary waveforms of different types, sinusoids, square waves, triangle waves. So we're going to output a sine wave. Uh, we can set the amplitude to say to 3 volts and we can leave it, well let's leave it at 1 kilohertz. Um, if we look at the output we can then run this and see what we get. Um, I'm not seeing much because I forgot to start the wave generator. Start the wave generator and it behaves exactly as we would expect. Set the offset so we can overlay the two waves together. And now you can see and we can zoom in a little bit by changing the time base. Um, so what was I at? One millisecond. So let's go down to 200 microseconds. So that's the characteristic that you would expect of a PN junction diode. You can see the input is the orange. Uh, signal and the output is the blue and you can see that we've got a voltage drop uh, due to the, um, well, the PN junction um, and you can see that when the junction is in reverse bias that we do not get a current flowing so this is the characteristic that we'd expect uh, from that type of uh, diode. We can do things like measure so I can add in measurements so let's add in uh, on the say channel 1 which is our yeah, C1 is our input signal. We can let's get the the maximum, and we can add that and the minimum, and the peak to peak, and we can get the amplitude. And let's say for channel two, we can get the maximum. Oops, I think uh, amplitude. I meant to put the maximum, the minimum, um, and we can check anything like that. So so that's okay. So straight away, uh, we have our values so we can get the maximum which is three close to three volts the, the well what might be interesting here is the, the minimum on the negative of the of the output so you can see it's about 170 millivolts so if we can uh, we can do a single so we can pause that so there we get our minimum our maximum our amplitude is 1.4 volts on the output uh, amplitude on the input side, 3 volts, perfect. So it's useful to be able to see this, we could look at higher frequency effects, we can increase the frequency directly with the slider and see uh, the impact here, we can change the time base down, to go down to nanoseconds and you can see straight away there the higher frequency, you know, so we don't, the, the blue doesn't go down as low and that's because we're limited, um, according to this type of diode, is limited by the uh, junction capacitance. So here it's 15 picofarads. So it means that it's like as if it's, it has a capacitive effect at higher frequencies. Um, so that's that's the basic functionality. Obviously we can change this. We can go back down. Let's go back down to um, one. Uh, well, let's go back down to 10 kilohertz and change this back up to a higher time base. Let's go a bit higher than that. Okay, so. What about other functionality? Well, we can easily change this to be a square wave. Um, so I'll put a square wave into our circuit and see the effect. Um, and you know, we can we can straight away we can have different types of waves in random input, see what the effect is, and we can do on a single to see what the effect is on on the output. So quite powerful generator. Um, we can have more advanced waveform sweeps. I'll just run this again. Um, and we can we can add in even advanced modulate signals and see what the effect is on the output. Um, we can do a signal here so we can see the effect on the output, which is very interesting. Um, so quite a lot of functionality available in our waveform generator and in our, uh, our well, there's even more in our oscilloscope that we'll get to in a second. Um, we can do things like well, let's let's go back to a simple sinusoid. Uh, we can go then down to an XY plot, for example. Oh, no, let's run it for our simple simple case. Let's go down to 1 kilohertz, so it's easier to understand. Yeah, so that's that's what we'd expect in the XY output. You can see that um, the relationship between the input and the output, this is input against output, C1 against C2. So you can see that there's almost zero um, when it's negatively biased on the downward side of the cycle and on the positive side of the cycle you can see that there's almost a linear relationship once you're past the point there's a linear relationship between the input and output so that's the xy plot we can get the histo we can get the histogram which shows us the you know well, the histogram <laughs> uh, we can also add in 
mathematics channel. So a simple mathematics channel. And we can do things like this. We can say, well, let's look at C1 minus C2. And now we've got a new plot, custom, where we can actually define our two. So we could say, for example, let's look at the absolute value of C1. Okay, and that gives you, if you can imagine, a perfectly rectified version of C1. So straight away, you can see that that, that could be quite useful uh, for describing uh, something that you want to compare it to. Uh, we can get the FFT to show us the frequency response and change parameters like the window type, uh, scaling, um, and so on. So a lot, of, a lot of functionality available here. And we can look at the frequency response of our inputs and outputs. Um, can we change the window type? Um, well let's let's change to a square wave, which will make it be slightly. Let me see, a square wave, and let's just go to a different. It doesn't matter really, but let's go to a smaller dimension. Seconds of division, and let's see if we can change the frequency up a bit. So you can see here straight away we get we can see the FFT effect becomes very obvious now in terms of seeing our, our main components of our signal. So it's quite a powerful, quite a powerful piece of software. Um, if we go back to simple sinusoid, uh, let's go to other windows, other functionality that's available. Well, there's an audio output, which is interesting. So we can see the effect of change in the frequencies. Sorry, it's here, the effect of change in the frequencies. Uh, 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 there's an uh, there's a ranging going on here, s scaling going on here with the output, but you can hear the output, so it's going to be quickly become quite annoying. Stop. Okay. Um, we can also load in arbitrary waveforms, so we can load in uh, a sample. Let's set the frequency for for my input. So it's 44.1, it's just a regular WAV file. Um, and let's auto this again. Amplitude 3 volts. And we're set for channel 1. Hello world. Hello world. So you see I'm Hello able world. to load in a Hello world. audio sample Hello world. as my input from my world. wave generator. Hello world. That's obviously Hello world. just saying Hello world, Hello world. Um, Hello as a WAV Hello file. World. And I can Hello look world. at the output because that's going into Hello the world. diode. Hello world. Hello world. So hopefully you can Hello hear world. the distortion on the sound Hello because I'm, I'm putting Hello it through world. the diode. You can, you can see the output if we change channel. Turn off channel Hello 1. World. Oops. Hello 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 okay. Hello and and Hello that's quite useful in terms of uh, if you were to have audio samples that you wanted to try as signals into a circuit that you can do you can do that directly using this set of tools so quite a quite a powerful set of tools from uh, you know at, at a reasonable price point on the analog side and there's a lot of analysis that we can do with these set of tools and uh, directly and that's before I even start discussing all of the digital tools that are available in this device as well so I'm very impressed with how feature rich the analog side is for looking at for as an education tool for being able to take a component and look at the effect and measure the effect it really does allow you to get hands-on with these devices and have a look at the devices and how they behave and what their characteristics are like for this part of the video I'm going to look at the digital features of the digital and waveform software and the analog discovery tool uh, I'm going to use the voltmeter, the analyzer, the pattern generator, and also the static I.O. To do this, I'm going to use a very simple IC that we see in digital electronic education, which is a JK flip-flop. It's an interesting flip-flop because it has this toggle state, which is when you set J is equal to 1 and K is equal to 1, it goes into a toggle state where the output changes on every complete clock cycle. In this case here, I've got a negative edge triggered flip-flop, which means that on the negative cycle of the, flip of the clock, we see that change taking place. So it's a Philips Semiconductor JK flip-flop, 
HCT112. And if we look at the, uh, you know, the data sheet, we can see here's our inputs outputs. We've got our pin description with our pins and our pin configuration. So I've wired that here. You can see here that I have my, my chip wired. I have pins one, two, three, four, five. What do these pins mean? Well, pin one is our clock input. Pin two is our data input for K and J is pin three. Pin four is SD, which is active low, which is an asynchronous um, set. So we don't, we, we want to set that high to turn off that condition. Uh, Q and Q bar, our outputs are on pins five and six. Uh, our ground is on pin eight. Pin 16 is our supply. And pin 15 is our active uh, reset or asynchronous uh, reset. So we want that to be high to turn that off as well. So I wired that up here. I've I've mapped the pins, so I'm using pins 1 to one to 15 here on the analog discovery. The only other thing I have to do now is just to add power, so I'm going to set the ground to pin 8 and set VCC uh, to pin 16. Oops, missed. So that means now that my chip is, is fully wired. So you can see the only thing I've got connected to this, I have no external power, I'm going to use the analog discovery to power this. So we can do that by turning on the voltage supply and turning on the power. So you can see here it has this useful uh, barometer to say how much power consumption has been used. It's a 5 volt fixed supply which is perfect for this application. Uh, so we're going to use the pattern generator and the analyzer. So we want to add signals and the signals map. These are our outputs from the discovery to the actual uh, JK flip-flop. So we want to add our signals. So the first one, again, I'm using the same input outputs. I've mapped them directly to the pin numbers to make it easy. So pin one, which is connected to DIO one, is going to be our clock. Uh, so I need to change this to clock. Um, okay, and we can leave it as a one kilohertz clock. Uh, PP means push-pull, uh, has values of uh, one and zero. Um, so we want to then add J and K are our inputs. So we add signals for our J. So pin two is K and we want push pull and we want to set this high. So again, the JK flip flop, when we set J is equal to one and K is equal to one, we get this toggled state arising. So I've set both J and K are equal to one. SD bar is active low, so we want to set that high to turn off that asynchronous condition. So SD bar, DIO four, set this, push pull, set it high. I could have wired these directly to my uh, input out, my, to my supply, to VCC, but it would mean that we wouldn't be able to change it if we want to see later on. And pin 415 is our reset. We want to set that to be uh, high as well, to turn off that condition. Okay, so that's our outputs from the analog discovery to our chip setup. I also want to set up the analyzer to look at what's happening. So we're going to add the signals in, and some of the signals I'm going to use are going to be the same ones. For example, uh, I need the, I want to see the clock, so uh, I'm going to, and I want to be able to synchronize it. So I'm going to add this clock back in here as well. So that was pin one. So we add that. Oh, I don't know where that data is from. It must be from an old. Um, hopefully, clear that. Um, we're at kilohertz, so I want to set my time base something large. Okay, um, and then my. Q and Q bar at pins five and six. So add signals pin five, this would be Q, and add signal pin six. Okay, so we're ready to go. So if I run this, okay, that means I'm generating my clock. I don't see it. Oh, I'm at 50 nanoseconds of division, so let's go to milliseconds. 10 milliseconds, let's see your reasonable base so we can get a better view. Um, one millisecond division. So there we go. So there's our clock. Uh, you can see every one millisecond we're getting a complete uh, clock cycle. Uh, well, at one kilohertz. So now we can do a single on this and run and get our outputs. That's a little bit fine. So we go back to the same base. So one milliseconds of division. Uh, run a single again. Uh, so here you can see our output so there's our clock coming in and down below we've got Q and Q bar so Q bar is the opposite of Q which is exactly what we would expect you can see Q bar here is inversion of Q 
and you can also see that the clock has twice the frequency of Q and you can see as well that the output is changing on the negative edge of the clock signal. So we go a little bit closer and we just run single again. You can see here's our clock and on the negative edge you can see we're getting a change on the Q output of our of our flip-flop. So that shows exactly how the flip-flop works and that's very useful for us to be able to analyze. I've connected nothing else to the JK flip-flop, no external power supply or anything, and we're just using the analyzer and the digital pattern generator to get all information about how it works. If we were to change this to something like a, let's say a low frequency pulse, say, let's say uh, five hertz and run that, we can also use this static IO um, which is a nice little window so we can add these virtual LEDs if you like to the output so you can hear pin 1 is our clock and it's flashing at 5 hertz so 5 times a second and you can see that our clock, our Q and Q bar output so Q is pin 5, DIO 5 and DIO 6 is Q bar so they're always the opposite of each other so you can see here sort of if you were to connect LEDs to the, the circuit here, this is how it would behave as well. So these virtual IOs are, are useful. There's also a vert, a, IOs for seven second displays. Obviously it has no meaning here, um, but that's useful. Uh, it's useful to be able to do that as well in terms of what, what we can do. Input outputs, so I better not connect that as a slider. <laughs> Bit IO. Uh, we can also get deeper information about our, 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 our gate for example let's say if I'm if I set the frequency to be quite large say 10 megahertz and we have to go down to nanoseconds so let's say 20 nanoseconds of division so now we're at the nanoseconds so 10 to the minus 9 uh, we can then set this to something like uh, 10 nanoseconds and let's do a run a single okay so this is interesting because you can see here, well there, there's an interesting change, we can see again the clock is the first row, so you can see that on the negative edge, the falling edge of the clock, we've got a delay before we get a toggle on the Q output, and this is our propagation delay. So you can see here we're dealing with nanoseconds per 10 nanoseconds per division, so roughly between there and there is about 20 nanoseconds, so that gives us an idea of of how long the propagation delay is of this gate. And if we go back to the data sheet, um, you can see, I saw it when I came past at the start, you can see that our clock pulse to Q, changing Q or Q bar, is 19 millisecond for a HT, HCT, which is the chip I'm using here, high-speed CMOS. So you can see we, we have, uh, we have uh, we can say that that value is valid according to our analysis. So that's it's very useful as an education tool. You can look at an IC, see how it behaves under different input outputs. Yes, you're limited to 16 input outputs, but that's enough for uh, for quite a few ICs. You can get you can get to understand how to use this tool and perhaps buy more expensive tools then later if you wanted to look at more complex ICs at uh, greater frequencies. In this part of the video, I'm going to use the analog discovery to do something more complex to analyze a bus. In this case, I'm using the BeagleBone Black, and I have two sensors here, an accelerometer and a gyroscope. These sensors are sitting on the I2C bus, and I'm going to use the analog discovery to look at the I2C bus while I'm actually sending and receiving values from these sensors back to and from the BeagleBone. So that's a use, a good use of this device, and it's a it's a powerful feature. So here you can see that I, I have my BeagleBone Black P9 header, and you can see that in this case I'm using the I squared C2 uh, bus. So it's pins 19 and 20. So pin 19 is the clock SCL, and pin 20 is data SDA. So I'm going to connect up to the BeagleBone. Log into the BeagleBone. So log in as root password root and at just at the moment this is using a version of uh, 3.8.13 Linux 3.8.13 and if we go to cd slash dev uh, you can see hopefully that we've got i2c0 and i2c1 okay so they're set up as devices so for this I'm going to use the tools that are associated with the, uh, the with the I2C device, so I'm just going to temporarily disconnect the clock. So if you see this, if we go and we say I2C detect, uh, providing if I2C 
tools installed, minus Y, minus R1. You can see that we can look at all the devices on the bus and you can see that some of these are, are not available, but there's no other devices on the bus. If I reconnect the clock back into the BeagleBone, pin 19, and my devices are obviously wired correctly, I can now do the same call and you can see that we have two devices appear uh, at address 40 and address 69. So one of these is the accelerometer, I think it's uh, 40, and the other one is the gyroscope at 69. So we're able to then say, let's get information from these devices. So we can dump information from, let's say, 0 by 40. We can say I, I2C dump minus Y just to say yes we want to do it uh, from bus 1 the address 0 by 40 and then this gives us all of the information that's available so the, this information would for example the first few registers here would give it would, would give us access to the registers of the accelerometer to tell us the position in three dimensions it's a three-axis accelerometer so these values change as you move the as you move the as you move the device so let's just move the device just to see so I can rotate the device and you'll see that the values have changed. Okay, so up here we have see we can see that there's been quite a change here. These ones here are probably set as the manufacturer code. So we'll read this value back on its own back from the BeagleBone. So we can say, well, I two C get um, minus Y one zero by forty. So bus one, the device address forty. Yes, to say we 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 we, we want to go ahead. No prompt. And we want to read in the value from zero by zero zero. So we know, and it's a byte. So we know that we should get back the value three. So if we do this, we get back the value three. Okay, so that's good. So I have a test set up so that I can test that the devices are working correctly. So I'm gonna start up the analyzer. So start up the analyzer. And we want to now, in this case, we wanna say, well, let's add an interpreter for the I squared C bus. So I'm gonna pick two pins. So I'm gonna use two available pins. So pin seven and 15. So I can use, let's say I use pin seven. I'll use this for the clock. So it's connected to my yellow wire. And I'm gonna connect the brown one with the white stripe to the data, the green. Okay. So that's my analog discovery connected in. So uh, just let me double check that. So the brown wire is pin seven, that's going into the yellow wire, which is the clock. So the brown wire is the clock. So that's seven is the clock. And the second wire, the stripey wire, which is pin 15, is going into the data. So the data is pin 15. Okay, press okay. So now we have our, our uh, analyzer set up. Um, Let's make this window smaller again. So we should now, uh, this should still work. Yeah, so that's still working. So everything's still fine even after I've connected the discovery. So what I'm gonna do now is say, well, let's look at this. I'm not sure about the timings yet. We can set up a trigger because otherwise, so let's say the clock on a rising edge, on the clock, no, a rising edge on the clock. We can say run a single. Now, one thing I notice about this is you have to go into settings options. The auto trigger timeout is set by default to two uh, seconds, which is very short. So set this to 10 seconds. Press OK. And we can do run a single. And now it's armed. You can see the arm sign here. And if I do the same operation again, ah, beep, ah, nice beep. You can see here that it's captured information. And straight away, we can, we can see that uh, device 40, uh, we're writing uh, 00, zero. So that's the address that we want to receive from. And then we're reading from device 40, the value hexadecimal tree. So that's that's what we'd expect. So we've written and then see the numbers all align. Uh, we can zoom in on this device. You can see here's the clock and this, this is indicative. You can see that this is working correctly. So maybe if we just zoom, you can create a new zoom window. I thought, okay. It opens a new window and you can set the position. So let's say we wanted to look at the first part. This is the right. You can see the start. So you can see that in this case here, it's clear that's what happened here when the I squared C bus, you can see that uh, start when SDA is pulled low while SCL is high, that's the start bit. So you can see that's happening there. SDA is low, 
uh, while S is pull low while SCL is high. So you can analyze this and check the timings and check that this is working correctly. So that's good. Um, it shows the type of functionality that's there. It's not incredibly uh, advanced in terms of there's, there's support for other buses, there's support for uh, SPI as well and for uh, for UART as well. So it could be useful for a project to be able to, de to debug your circuit and find out what's going on if you were having a problem. Um, and I think that's really it. I think I can change that. I can get in closer. Let me just try and get in closer, zoom in a little bit closer. You can get down to the samples so you can see your, your timings and so on. You can move back and forth across the bits and see exactly what's going on on the I2C bus. So another useful feature of this Digilent uh, waveforms tool. So in conclusion, the analog discovery coupled with waveforms provides a rich set of tools. Okay, they're limited on the analog side to a five megahertz bandwidth, and on the digital side, it's limited to 16 channels and 100 million samples per second. However, as a teaching and independent learning tool, it is ideal. Also, for hobbyists, it's a great way to become familiar with the type of features that you would like to have available in more expensive hardware. And I suppose if you know of better solutions, please let me know.